Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of AF Chats. I have a pretty cool topic for you today, very different than what I usually talk about. And I have a new guest, Martin. Say hello to Martin as we welcome people in. How's it going, Martin? Uh, all is good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> always. Yeah. Well, not always, but at, at the moment, yeah. things are pretty. <laughs> that's a that's the right attitude, I think. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, broadcasting from uh, from London, England. Nice. Welcome to London. I am, as usual, we kick off with what's in our cup and where we're from. I'm broadcasting from New York City, and I'm drinking some Earl Grey tea, my favorite. One day, I will have a different tea, I promise. And it's probably going to catch everyone off guard and no one's going to pay attention. So pay attention. Let us know I'm what you're drinking. London tap water from my branded Pollen VC bottle. All righty. There we go. So let it's us know. <laughs> let us know where you're from in the chat and what you're drinking. And we're going to get started very, very soon once people start shuffling in. And I see it. People asking, is it tea time? It's always tea time. I drink six of these a day. If you're a Brit, it's also always tea time. Yeah. I'm not even British, and I still drink six of these a day. I used to drink multiple espressos a day, which was awful. So I kind of got myself off of that, and now maybe one a day, maybe. But mostly tea. Yeah, I'm trying to wean myself off the espressos as well. Yeah, it's good for a little bit, but then eventually, and it's fun, and you're like, I'm drinking espressos, I'm cool. But eventually, it's like, no, you get headaches, and it's terrible. Yeah, no coffee after lunchtime rule is the, is the thing for me. Yeah. I, funnily enough, can drink espresso at any time and not have any sort of impact, I think at least. And I think that's always, always problematic. <laughs> but you, know, you know something is wrong when that's, the, when that's what happens. But cool. I see people from all over the world. India is here. I see what else? Turkey is here. Chester Boulder tea. That's interesting. Chester Builders tea. I don't even know what that is, but apparently that's a thing. But Builders tea is English breakfast tea. Uh, oh. The nickname for it that we call it in England. Interesting. I learned something new about tea. I also have English breakfast tea. It's a lot more sharp. I like the Earl Grey, just more soft. So obviously, we came to this AF chat to talk about tea and to learn everything else about tea and where it's from. No, just kidding. Just kidding. Cool. Irish coffee in Miami. Irish coffee right now? It's 1035. Well, as long as you enjoy it. But I think people are in. I think we're ready to go. Are you ready, Morton? Uh, all good from my side, yeah. Cool. Always. Yeah, I should have known. So, cool. Welcome to a brand new episode of AF Chats. We're going to be talking about money today. And normally, I talk about more organic things, how to do app store optimization, how to optimize really anything about your app and the experience inside to get more users. But there is more to that, especially if you're trying to get growing really, really, really fast. And as many of you probably know, Apple Search Ads made paid ads really easy. Everyone is using them. And I know people who scaled some campaigns so fast from nothing to so much money spent every month. And it is working. And I think that's the key. It wasn't always like this, but it is now beyond Apple search ads. You have a plethora of ad networks that can help you grow. And there are ways to turn that growth into more growth. So I brought Morton here because Morton has a pretty interesting offer that I've known about for many, many years now. We talked before the show, and I think, Martin, you said you started in 2015. Is that right? Yeah, we incorporated the company 2014 and then mm -hmm. did our first lending in, in 2015. That's wild. 2015 feels like a lifetime ago at this point. Tell me about it. We, we, we founded the business because we as developers had the problem uh, that we solve, and we couldn't find anyone in the financial services space to uh, to, to to fix it. So it was one of these... Uh, I was the guy with the problem type of story. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what that feels like. And it seems that was a good era to have that. So many different companies started around that time, maybe a little bit before, and are now really pivotal in the space. 
if I'm if I'm honest, it took it took quite a it took a few years for basically the market to figure out what we did and basically how we basically would position ourselves in the market as well. Uh, but once we started to have some uh, some phenomenally good case studies around, I guess from the end of 2016, 2017, uh, the market for you know it 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 just became way better understood as a as a financing alternative. Yeah, I have seen it mature over time, and I think even to this day, there's still enough people who don't know that this is a possibility. Hence, this AF chat, which hopefully will enlighten more people to this, because I think it's a pretty good idea. So. Back to talking about ads, usually ads cost money. When I say usually, I mean always. And you have this now vicious cycle of where do you start? You can spend your own hard-earned money on ads if you have that money, and that's great because then you don't have to owe it to anyone. And usually that money should make more money, which should make more money, which should make more money. That's kind of the plan. But can you do that faster? And the answer is absolutely. There are a whole bunch of different ways to get money. Got to find investors. Boom, money. Not really at all, obviously. So there are alternatives to getting investors to give you money to fund that growth. And over time, I think that has also become different. Back in 2015, the VC landscape was very different than what it is now, now, even now, a year ago. But if you don't want to do that, because that comes with its own set of challenges and its own set of issues, maybe is a good way to say Consequences, ramifications, all those words. Um, all but there of the are, above. Yeah, exactly. Or all of the above, yeah. But there are alternatives, and one of the alternatives is Poll and VC, which will help you use your own money to fund your growth faster. Morton, can you tell us, first of all, welcome. Second, can you tell us a little bit more about Poll and VC? What does that mean to use your money to fund your growth faster? And we'll go from there and talk about how that can be used by anyone who's in who's watching us right now cool well um first of all thanks uh, errol for having me on the show i've been a, a fan for a long time <laughs> um so at poland vc we we provide what we call revolving credit facilities um to app and also mobile game developers to help them scale faster so um what that means is that well the, the problem we're solving really is that if you think about the um the payment delay from when a user is purchasing maybe a subscription via an IAP, and then when you actually see the money um, for that, there is can, can be quite a significant payment delay. So on, on iOS, you can be looking at up to 67 day delay. On uh, Google Play, it can be up to a 45 day delay. Um, <clears throat> so we started off with a thesis that if you had faster access to the money, um, you could reinvest faster on the basis that when you're putting money into into paid ads, whether it's search ad, search ads or on on Google ads or whatever it may be, that you're able to detect a positive ROI. So really, everything comes down to um, the first the first stage of what we have, we have a concept of the user acquisition machine. And the, the user acquisition machine sort of really falls into into three camps. First of all, which is unfortunately where most people fall over, you're asking the question is like, do I have a UA machine? And what we mean by that is, um, do I have an investment formula where I can put money into user acquisition and with a high degree of probability slash certainty, I can I can invest that money profitably. So I get a larger return. If I you know invest a dollar, am I going to get more than a dollar out? And how long does it take me to, um, to, to recover that? So basically, we've got positive, what we call positive unit economics. I invest money, I get more money out the other end. Now, unfortunately, what happens with a lot is if you put a dollar in and you get 90 cents out, then there's it, it paid acquisition doesn't make sense. But it's a binary thing. If you put a dollar in, you get a dollar ten out, then it does make sense. And it's more a question of then how quickly can you um can you reinvest this money? So first stage of the machine is, you know, is do I have this formula that I can invest money? profitably. And if you can, uh, and you think you can scale the app using paid acquisition, then you move on to the next stage. So the next stage is basically saying, where am I going to find the capital? Where am I going to find the cash to put into the machine? And um, so traditionally, um, as, as you said, to start with, like, you know, I need money, I go to investors. And so the traditional thinking, and this is something we came up against, certainly in the, in the, you know, from 2015 to say 2018, maybe predominantly, it's like, hey, if I need money, 
I go back to my equity investors, I give away a chunk of my company, and then I get the money I need to put into marketing. And um, gradually, as our model has become kind of um, better understood and you know somewhat uh, you know somewhat copied as well, um, the there's a greater understanding in the market. There's like, hey, you don't have to give away equity in order to raise capital. So the way our model works is we take a feed digitally from the app stores and also mobile advertising networks if there's any ad network revenue cycled in. And what we verify programmatically, we verify all the money that has been earned, but not yet paid out by the app stores and the ad networks. And all we're doing is we give you a line of credit um, up to that amount, sometimes more. And all we're doing there is we're saying, if you have $10,000, $50,000, 100000 a million, whatever the number is, in trapped revenues that have been earned but not paid out, we can allow you to draw on the credit line to take the money down. Now, you should only want to take the money down if you can reinvest it into pay, into more paid ads to reinvest quicker. So I sometimes use the slot machine analogy. Um, Errol, if you and I were to end up in Las Vegas and we found the slot machine that paid out two bucks every time we put in one. Question, do we wait 30 to 60 days before we go back to that machine? Of course not. We wanna put as much money in that machine as quickly as possible. In this case, everything is recycling every day. So what we would rationally wanna do is to invest as much as possible until what happens is the machine stops paying out. And then you move on to another machine. So. Mm -hmm. It's a slightly crude analogy, but it's basically it's unit economics. It's demand and supply. I want to keep investing in paid acquisition for as long as my return is exceeding my, uh, my you know, my acquisition cost. What happens over time, and this is the third stage of the machine, is my machine ends up running at full capacity. Now, full capacity is basically what happens over time is the acquisition costs rise, so you pay more for users. And then the LTVs of the users, the lifetime values of users tend to fall a little bit. So at some stage, you're basically, if you if you have a $5 acquisition cost and a $5 LTV, it doesn't make sense to keep on spending. So at whatever equilibrium level of spend, whether it's, you know, 100 bucks a day, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 a day, at some stage, the economics will cap out where it doesn't make any more sense. So that's really what we think of as the machine um, running at full capacity. Oh, wow. That was uh, pretty much everything very succinctly. So, so much to unpack here. So much of that, so many questions that I, I have that would come out of this. So um, just if we, if we zoom out all the way, the idea is if you have an app that is generating revenue and the revenue it's generating exceeds what it would cost to acquire new users, why not do it faster? And you do it faster by getting the access to that money faster through Poll and VC. That's kind of the idea until you can't anymore. And at that point, something else needs to happen. Am I, is, is this still the high yeah, level? It, you know, it, it, exactly that. So what, what happens is, I mean, <clears throat> like we ask, we ask typically a very, what sounds like a dumb question. Maybe it's a dumb question. <laughs> so when we find, you know, when we're talking to, um, to, to app studios or game developers um, who are investing in paid acquisition, right? Um, cause that, that's how, and, and typically everyone's trying to scale their app or scale their game. So we ask a dumb question, which is why aren't you spending more on user acquisition? Mm -hmm. And there's two camps that the answer can fall into. So one is like, look, I can't spend any more because the market can't take it. If I were to increase my bid, I'm going to be buying unprofitable users. There's a, I'm basically at full capacity. I have the cash to do it. I just. I, I, you know, the, the, the market, the economics of the market won't let me continue to spend because I'm effectively capped out. I'm already at, at capacity. And you know what? That's absolutely fine. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a, there's a certain, you know, every app has a different addressable market and, and parameters around that. So if it's just like, look, I'm spending as much as I can, but if I start increasing what I'm paying, I'm going to be doing so unprofitably. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fine. It's just a factor of the market move to the other side. And if someone says, oh, you know what, I would love to be spending more on paid UA or search ads or you know wh whatever, but I am somehow if, if, if capital constrained. So if the response is anything to do with like, 
hey, I'm waiting to raise more money from my investors, or I need a bigger credit line from Google, or I am just, you know, I'm waiting to be paid before I can start reinvesting. And if it's yeah. anything to do with capital or credit, you know, th that's absolutely when you should kind of reach out when you know it's working. Yeah. But, but you're not, you know, you just can't spend enough. Uh, sometimes we get some inbounds, which I, I love. It's what we call the hair on fire problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, most of what we do is people in, in soft launch, they're gearing up, it's working. We get an early look and uh, we're able to help out. But sometimes we get the we get the panicked call saying, hey, this app is going crazy. <laughs> and every day we're not working with you. We're leaving money on the table. How quickly can we get funded? <laughs> What's the answer to that? Yeah. How quickly can you get funded? So, so typically within, if it's a hair on fire, we've, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we can move pretty quickly, typically within seven days. Oh, wow. So just about a week and you can yeah. have a business week or yeah. more than a uh, business week. You can have enough money to grow. Well, here, here's an interesting thing, right? So if you are, if you compare that in terms of, you know, access to capital, if you want to raise a venture capital round, you're looking mm -hmm. at a minimum of three, you know, anything up to six months from yeah. your initial conversation to term sheet to diligence to Easy. more diligence. And that I, that I think at the moment is just getting longer, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the FOMO rounds of 2021, <laughs> have, you know, have long since dried up, right? Yeah. Um, but if it's, you know, and you have a lot of approvals and so on, and it's, it's mm -hmm. a big decision. If you're putting in place a credit facility, because that credit facility is secured against the revenue stream of money that that we know is coming from Apple or Google or whoever, um, it's a very different kind of, uh, it's a, a different profile. It's a diff completely different set of documents and so on. Importantly, you're not giving away a stake in your company. Uh, you're just effectively um, pledging us the the money that's coming in from Apple or Google that we're lending against. Yeah. So it's a much simpler structure to actually put in place um, and therefore, the you know the documentation is lighter, the diligence is lighter, um, because it's lending against a very specific asset that is you know it's verified every day um, electronically. Yeah, I think the idea that you're not really you're borrowing money, but at the end of the day, you're also not exactly borrowing money in the sense that you're getting money that you don't have. This is money that you do have, but you just don't have access to it right now because Apple decided to play with exchange rates and make a little bit more cash on your cash. Which is very interesting. Yeah, it's. I mean, the the the. It's more the exchange rates a thing. Actually, the, the we we found it to be sort of fairly fairly transparent. The thing is the payment delay, right? So you as a consumer, you're buying a subscription. Your car, credit card is getting charged today, mm -hmm. and that money's sitting in the bank of the platform, and it's not being paid out anything yep. up to forty five to sixty seven days later, right? Yep. And, and that's that's what we're solving for. So exactly, if you know if you know that you're able to spend, and you could be doing it faster and and reinvesting faster, if you like, that that's the that's the problem we solve for. Just helping you helping you grow faster, but without relying on external capital. Yeah. There are a few good questions in the chat I want to bring up. So let me bring those up. One is from Adir who is saying, the problem with this business logic is that maybe now I can do a dollar and 10 cents from every dollar spend, but on scale, it is harder to keep making a dollar and 10 cents from every dollar. Why do you think that is? It, it's just all down to demand and supply economics, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if, you, if you think back to, you know, to econo I, I studied uh, a very long time ago. I, I did an economics degree. My very first, my very first um, lecture was demand and supply. So it's basically, you know, your, uh, you know, you've got demand and supply curves, your CPI, your LTV, and you know, unfortunately, these are um, the, the the gradients of these curves can vary a lot. So slightly, you know, normally it's like you think if I'm buying more, I should get a quantity discount, but actually it works. It works kind of the opposite. You're in an auction system and you're bidding for, you know, users that meet a certain profile. So what happens to start with, you are, you know, if I've got an, an app that's very in a very specific niche, I'm going after my power users, my super users for that. And they're prepared to pay X. And then as soon as you go out in sort of concentric circles, people are, you know, you know people are, um, you know, they, they, the LTVs are going to go down, but also the more you try and buy, the price is going to go up. So it's really mm, back also to, true. it's it's really just back to, uh, to, to you and economics. We have a, we have a YouTube explainer on our, our channel about demand economics of mobile advertising. 
Um, and it's really, it's really just the same as uh, any sort of economic theory of any any marketplace. Yeah. But it's, I, I agree. For a developer, it's super frustrating because you mm-hmm. think, hey, I've got this formula. I can make you know yeah. ten cents every thirty days. But as soon as I put my foot on the gas, boom, the price just goes through the roof to make yep. to make. Um, but that that's that's why it happens. And I think there's also an additional side to this, where it is it's your targeting, because at the end of the day, when you advertise real small, and I've been talking about how to optimize everything and how to target everything. Lately, I've been looking a lot at Apple search ads and how unoptimized it is right out of the box from Apple, which I think is just crazy that Apple makes this happen and also supports us and also asks users to do it. So we're building a product tool that will help with that. But as I'm learning about this more and I'm working with developers and I'm seeing what keywords they use and what campaigns they're setting up, they're totally unoptimized. And I think if you are spending enough money right now to see some growth and you've t- taken your time and you have something that works for you, when you scale it, it's not just going to scale itself. You have to be as, uh, as I would say, diligent as possible about keeping that targeting, making sure that you're talking to the right users because just spending a dollar to get an impression or whatever it is doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the right impression that would turn into a download. And the same issue happens with App Store optimization. Once you start and broaden your terms or start and broaden your keywords, you end up really losing out on that sort of targeting that now gets you people who are not exactly interested in your app. Maybe they saw it, maybe it's something interesting uh, for a split second, but they're not going to download. And I think that's where those unit economics change drastically. So as you do more user acquisition, you have to continue to do user acquisition. It's not the kind of thing that will do itself just because you throw more money on it. Correct. It's absolutely not a set and forget. And yep. we've seen some horrendous stories of people that have just, you know, been on set and forget and then just lost a ton of money. So, you know, as you guys uh, know, it's, you know, great tools and and support is very important in, mm-hmm. uh, in, in doing that properly. But also, you know, just like having a really, really close eye on the unit economics and knowing when to pull back. If you think something is not working, you see campaigns not working, pull back and then yep. double down on stuff that is. So you're constantly, you know, you're constantly, um, you know, testing, retesting and uh, doubling down on what's working. Yeah, I think that's really the key. So you have to keep optimizing. You have to understand the prices are going to go up. And that's a part of this machine. And that's why it's really important to have good economics to begin with. If you're only making a little bit of a margin, maybe this is going to be difficult. And maybe your goal should be, how can I make more before you go and you start throwing money on it? But as soon as you have that, that's actually good. There's look, there, there's two levers in the equation. One is your acquisition cost and one is your LTV, right? So your yeah. acquisition cost, you can get better at buying, you can try different channels, et cetera, focus on getting the price down. But the other thing you can do is like you can do you know, multivariant testing of different paywalls and all of these different things and mm-hmm. you know figure out what's going to work what, for one geo is not going to work for another, but just constantly testing them to, so you can eke every little bit of um of potential LTV out of them. Yep. The more clear blue water you have between your acquisition cost and your lifetime value, the more profit for you to take home. Exactly. And the more for you to actually drive growth with, which is also the key. Of course. Cool. We have another question. This one's from Jeroen, which I may not be pronouncing correctly. But the question is, if a new user costs five USD to acquire and the user's LTV is five USD, won't you still get an advantage because Apple will rank your app? The answer is not exactly. If you look at App Store optimization as kind of a side benefit of paid ads and you think about, well, I'll get the downloads and the downloads are definitely going to give me more, right? Uh, The answer is not exactly. The downloads could give you more. So when you think about App Store optimization, downloads aren't really the thing that impacts them. It's really rating, something I talk about a ton on the other, on all of my newsletters, pretty much. When I look at keyword teardowns, almost every keyword you can see that downloads aren't really the thing that supports them. What is supporting those ranks are the ratings that come from them. So if your app is optimized to get a rating out of really every possible download that comes into your app, great. Then it could potentially improve your ratings. If it isn't, then it's not really doing much. So there is the potential of turning $5 in customer acquisition cost and $5 LTV, which is a net of zero, into potential growth in the future if you take the time to do your optimization right 
in, then everything else will kick with it along the way, which is really the key every time you do any sort of optimization. If you only optimize the one thing, you're really missing out because they're all ultimately connected. Do you see any sort of um, kind of residual growth? Is that a part of the conversations that you have? Or is it more about, <clears throat> I can do X and get Y, the, the I mean, we, formula? So, so theoretically, when you said five in, five out, the way I think about it is that's your demand and supply curve intersecting, right? So you would be, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm paying five to make five, then theoretically, I'm not, you know, I'm not making any money. Do you get the potential halo um, yep. viral effects and some, uh, you know, from ratings and so on? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's possible if, as you say, you're doing it right. The one thing to consider, though, is if you're having to, if you're having to pay to finance it, right? So <clears throat> if you're borrowing money against it and you're paying a, an interest charge on a $5 uh, acquisition cost to make $5, then you're going to be underwater. Yeah. Um, so we often advocate for um, a, a, a return on investment mechanic that takes into account the value of time, right? So we call it MROI, mm -hmm. monthly ROI. And it came from some conversations we had with app developers uh, talking about kind of ROAS numbers. And they're talking about ROAS numbers as a, a phys as like just a static thing. So mm -hmm. I'm sitting having a conversation at a conference in Poland last uh, towards the end of last year. And the other guy's saying, yeah, I found a formula that works. I'm making 130% ROAS. And the guy next to him is like, hey, I've found a formula that works. I'm making 140% ROAS, right? And so, and the, the guy making 140% is like, hey, you know, I'm better at UA than you type of thing, was <laughs> anyway, right? And the reality was the guy that's making 130% is making it in 30 days. Whereas the guy that's making 140% is doing it in two years, <laughs> right? So unless you, unless you think about this sort of monthly you know, monthly return, um, the the context of, you know, ROI, ROAS, whatever you think, without the context yeah. of time, it's frankly a bit meaningless. And if if you figure out, say, hey, I'm making a 5% uh, monthly ROI, and it's costing me 1.5% to finance it, then your return goes from 5% to 3.5% because you have to factor in the cost of financing. So in this example, if you're paying five to make five, but you're but you're financing it, you know, with external credit facilities, whatever, you're most likely underwater because you're not factoring in your financing costs. So it's really important to do that as part of the overall equation. Totally agreed. I think that is such a good point. We should clip that and have that as a separate video. Your return on investment is not really a meaningful number unless you know how long it takes to get it back. Hundred percent oversimplification, but still. Now, next, I have another comment on this. I think I we may have found you a new customer. Dave Excellent. is saying, I literally had to pause my ads today after several months of successful ads until I get my Apple payment next week. Talk about Excellent. great timing. So uh, yes, please talk to Morton, Dave. Please reach out. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have a link Thank somewhere with all of your content or, information. Yeah. Whatever works. That's uh, that's great to hear. That's what we call the <laughs> hair on fire problem, right there. Mm -hmm. You know, we just talked about hair on fire. Cool. So Is in that... seven days, Dave, you're going to be really happy, potentially. <laughs> and every seven days thereafter, we hope. <laughs> Four, as long as the as long as the uh, the scaling can can still happen efficiently. <laughs> that's uh, that's really cool. I really like this. Cool. So. I think one of the um, one of the main questions that I see coming from developers is, or if I'm thinking, if I'm putting myself in the shoes of a developer, is who is this for? Who is this for in, in a variety of different ways, money-wise? If I'm making a dollar today, is this enough for me? If I'm making a billion dollars today, is this for me? Or if my app is an app that doesn't do subscriptions or does do subscriptions, you mentioned paywalls before, so subscriptions are definitely one of those hot terms right now. And we and I've done a bunch of interviews about optimizing those landing pages and uh, and paywalls. And so I know that there are ways to use them even better. But is it for apps? Is it for games? Is it for uh, customers in the U.S.? Is it for game developers in Asia? What do you usually work with? And I know you also brought some. Uh, you have some examples for later on. So stick around, everyone. We're going to talk about specifics, more specifics. But sure. let's start with that. 
Okay, so 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 basically, what I'm what we look at the the problem is is the same at any almost at any scale. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if you're doing you know, and we have a theoretical minimum of twenty five thousand dollars per month in in uh, monthly revenue, but if you're doing twenty five thousand, two hundred fifty thousand, two and a half million, you know, and we work with we work with um, uh, apps and games doing up to ten million dollars per month, and the the question to ask is always the same. It's like, could I be investing more in UA? if I had more capital to do so. And, you know, the economics may be different. The cost of financing may be different at, you know, 50,000 versus 5 million. Of course, it's going to get cheaper the more you're the more you're borrowing, but the concept is the same. It's like, can I take this money um, with, a you know, the attached interest rate and can I invest into something that is going to yield me more by putting it into a, a paid ads mechanic? Um, uh, so, so that's the core unit economics in terms of like, you know, if if I'm going to borrow this money, can I invest it at a profit into my ads uh, formula? And that that's that's the same at any any kind of um, uh, value point of the curve. Um, next thing is in terms of uh, in terms of geography. So we have um, we have localized uh, documents for I think 14 different jurisdictions now. So you know we're um, regulated lender in the US. Uh, we operate in Canada, UK, all across um, Europe, and and some of Asia directly as well. Um, and then what we've been doing uh, recently is, you know, we're seeing more companies who are located in jurisdictions that have a sort of less friendly <clears throat> business climate. Um, and what a lot of them we're seeing now doing are incorporating a publishing entity, which is publishing the app or the game in the US or in Cyprus or in Malta or in the UK, you know, it, it's it's totally different, lots of different jurisdictions where they can enjoy the benefits of having a relatively low cost um, infrastructure, um, but uh, enjoy the in, enjoy the, you know, the other benefits of being in a jurisdiction where they're able to get credit facilities, where they can raise capital, et cetera. So, there is um we I recently wrote a a blog post it ended up being three blog posts because it was so long, um on our blog, holland.vc slash blog, uh, entitled "Structuring for Success" and this is talking about some of the jurisdictional aspects of you know how to incorporate how to set yourself up for success where you you know can access credit you can access capital and um, you know still operate a studio pretty much anywhere in the world. And we'll have a link to that in the description later. And in the email we send out at the end, I think that is, um, there's a lot of good stuff coming out of your blog. I've been getting the newsletter or I've been on the newsletter, so I've been getting the emails. Thank you. So, I mean, it's like we, we have um, pretty much everyone on the team has has uh, has stuff to chip in. We, we always write about the financial concepts, yeah. um, which is the bit, I mean, everyone talks about user acquisition and, you know, monetization and mm-hmm. and so on. And, and we've, uh, we've carved out, you know, kind of interesting, um, <clears throat> interesting spot, just always focusing on the financial aspects of, you know, growing the studio, you know, the accounting, the operations and so on. So, yeah, we, I mean, the, the whole goal for us is really to improve financial literacy among app developers and game <laughs> developers. Um, so that, that's why we write this stuff. That sounds so important. Yet at the end of the day, I feel like a lot of blogs and a lot of articles and a lot of uh, even reports, even data reports that come out from companies kind of focus on the fluff aspect of it. Like you should make more money. Okay, cool. I mean, thank you. <laughs> I didn't know. I wasn't sure. And I see the same thing with App Store optimization and with getting into the details. A lot of companies stay very high level. And I think there's this layer below that is, okay, but how? And not many blogs actually go into that level. Not many articles give you something that's actionable. So it's always interesting to see when a company does that. And to me, it means they know what they're talking about. So well done. Well, thanks. I, I mean, yeah. look, we, we we do it. We do a sort of like a, a two pronged strategy, right? So the, so the content we try and make it technical but accessible to yeah. try and sort of really highlight those points. But the other thing that's been phenomenally helpful for us, and and I hope our our um, our uh, you know customers and future customers has been a whole series of calculators that we have uh, that, that we have um, <clears throat> kind of released. They're totally free to use, and they help break down. Uh, important aspects, either around user acquisition and investment economics, or sometimes they break down kind of competitor pricing models, which are, 
you know, which are designed to sort of, you know, hide the true cost of financing. So we have a real, mm -hmm. uh, real sense of kind of transparency, you know, and we think that good things happen when you take time and effort to educate and, you know, try and provide some of the, you know, the knowledge as kind of finance guys in the, in the app and game space. Um, and that as a strategy has worked super well for us over the last few years. So we continue to invest time and effort in, you know, building the calculators, refining them, and then also writing the, the more technical content as well. Yeah, I think that's killer, especially when you have so many developers who are trying to build more. And I say developers, but it's really companies, it's really businesses. And when you have an app, you have a business. So it's it's good. I try to do the same thing with my writing, give stuff that's actionable, give stuff that you can take now and turn into money, whether it's through a tool or whether it's through just knowledge, sheer knowledge. So that's great. Yeah, the, the, those emails for me are on the must read list. I mean, a lot of <laughs> that's awesome. auto delete, but uh, yeah, you, you're you're putting out some right cool stuff as well. So thank you. Um, I think we're fairly aligned in terms of strategy there. Yeah, and, and that's really why you're here. I, we don't normally just bring people on to show what they do, but I think the concept is so interesting and the offering is so useful that it just makes sense to talk to someone who does this. Um, there is a question in the chat, a follow-up from Adir. Let's bring it up. Um, Adir is asking, what happens What happens if I decide to take money from Poland VC, but then I couldn't deliver positive return on ad spend as, we, as I thought? You know what? That's actually a great question. Um, <clears throat> so, if you if you think about it, what we're doing mechanically is we verify all of the receivables, the AR, the unpaid platform revenues every day, and then we are giving you access to that. So we we deposit money in your account, and then we collect this money at the other end. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to note this is money you've already earned, so it's gonna it's gonna come. It just is gonna come in 30, 40, 60 days time. So. If you are if you are investing, and, and here's the way it goes, and this is how a revolving credit facility works over any other products in the market. If you are investing into uh, ROAS positive, ROI positive, however you think about it, ads, then you're, uh, depending on how quickly you monetize that, your amount of available credit and revenues is just going to go up and up and up over time if the ROI is there on the ad spend. If, however, it's not, if you start off with, say, $100,000 and you keep investing in ads that are not profitable, your amount of available credit will come down and down and down, right? Because you're just not able to make that return. So in a way, and this is why, you know, obviously I, I would say this, but I kind of really like our model because it stops you getting over your skis in and investing in something that's not profitable. You There's some guardrails there. It's not one of these models where we say like, Here's a hundred thousand bucks. You're going to put it into a bunch of ads. We'll take a revenue share from these ads and we hope you're successful. That to me is like giving someone a bunch of casino chips and then waiting outside the front door praying their health, they're praying they're lucky. Right. There's just I I think that's just not not a great business. But if you if you think about ours, you're only advancing the revenue you've already earned. So you can't get into like a hey, I've just blown all this money and all of a sudden some angry lender is going to want to take my app or my business or whatever because I wasn't good at programming ads. So our model has got some these natural guardrails built in. So to the extent that if you want to be super binary about it, you know, yes, it's obviously good for everyone. If you've got positive ROAS, if you can invest this money, we all grow together. But if you don't and you just take the money and you invest it into something that is you know, you put a buck in, you get 50 cents out. Ultimately, the amount of receivables, the earnings you're going to make is just going to come down um, over time. So um, it's uh, hopefully a safer way to uh, to grow, not not allowing you to continually spend on something that's not that's not profitable. And I think that's a that's a really good point. This is not as if you go to the bank and get a loan that is secured by potential revenue. This is your money that is being held by Apple or by Google that you're getting access to earlier, which means you can't really overspend. It's it's already yours in a way, unless Apple decides to take it away or something crazy happens and I don't know, Apple just decides to shut down to shut down the App Store. I don't think that's gonna happen. So really it's your money that you're spending just ahead of when you would get it normally. It's it's really helping like it's your money, it's make it's making you making your money work harder, right? So if, yeah. the, if the app or the game is generating revenue, 
it can fund its own UA. Yeah, exactly. And that's really what I love about this model. And I think this model is so cool. In the old world of, of financing, the not the tech world, not the app world, this existed in a way, but it never really made its way into the app business, or it didn't up until fairly later in the game, 2015, you said. And, um, and I think that's such a, it's a good tool. I wouldn't say that it's the only tool, obviously, but it's such a good tool if you don't want the complications of investors, if you have, if you've built something good from the ground up. I fully believe in starting small and growing it all on your own, uh, using something like app store optimization or really any sort of techniques that you can fund and then using something like this to grow. You retain all your equity. You own your company. And it's the most satisfying um, to see founders and, and small teams that own 100% of their equity. They have bootstrapped mm -hmm. it. They've just been smart about how they finance it. And watching those guys kind of grow and get a nice exit without, you know, without necessarily having VC money around the table and stuff is super satisfying. I mean, we, yeah. we work with you know, a lot of VC-backed companies as well. Um, but somehow kind of emotionally, the most satisfying ones are the, are the guys who have, uh, you know, the, the, the teams of people who have, you know, who have built apps and games and, you know, grown big without having to rely on a bunch of external capital. Yeah, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I think it's so much more satisfying to know that you're creating growth, you're pushing growth, and you're doing that for yourself. You're doing that for your business, as opposed to you're riding some other, someone else's wave. It doesn't mean that it's bad, but if you can do it, why not? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's, there's lots of reasons to raise venture capital mm -hmm. and so on. And, and you know, so, some of it's sort of by necessity because, or or because it's easy, whatever. But the, the yeah. one one concept I wanted to kind of flag up is the one of cap called capital efficiency. So it's basically using the right form of capital based on the risk and reward profile of what you're going to do. So if you have some kind of you know, if you have some crazy idea of an app or a game that you want to build, it's going to take money to build it. So if you go and raise external capital, you say to a VC or an angel, hey, this is my concept. This is what we want to do. I need, you know, half a million dollars or $2 million, whatever the number is, to build it. That's at risk um, project, right? It's, it's high risk, high reward. You should be funding it through equity. The VC or the investor is going to take a stake in the company and you hope it turns into a billion dollar company you know, and everyone's happy. And and what's happening is if you if you think about you know relatively short term high certainty user acquisition cycles right so if I if I figure out I can turn a dollar into a dollar fifty in ninety days and I can do that at some form of scale then you know you're way better funding that through debt you have a small interest cost versus a you know versus a fifty percent you know a seventeen percent monthly return if you think of you know, three seventeen fifty one, whatever, and uh, you know, so it's going to cost you like you know a couple of points to finance it. You're making seventeen. Everyone's happy. But what we have seen before is people say, "Hey, I'm going to raise a you know a ten or twenty or thirty million dollar venture capital round, put the whole lot into ads on a six month or nine month payback period, whatever." Which is you know, it's cra it's a crazily dilutive, but for the founders. What they're doing really is effectively giving the venture capital fund an equity return for taking debt risk, right? So it's it's you know giving you a high return because you've taken 20, 30 percent of my company when I sh for for taking you know when you should be paying just a you know a couple of points in interest to to borrow the money. Mm -hmm. So that that you know we we try and preach the you know preach the capital efficiency. You know use use venture capital money. You know, keep it in the bank, use it for building product, hiring teams, uh, et cetera. But when you've got this sort of relatively short user acquisition cycle, as far as possible, use more a more efficient form of capital um, to finance that, such as obviously revolving credit, which is what we do here at Poland VC. Yeah, I, that all makes perfect sense. I don't think I can add anything to this, but I do have a question from the chat that I wanted to bring up. Um, let's see, where is the question that I wanted to bring up? question is okay here we go um the question is this assumes we get more than 1x return immediately what about a subscription model where the return on investment happens after the second year of the subscription uh so that all comes down to the MROI metric i was talking about mm -hmm. so if you invest a dollar 
you may break even in a year and then you may make another 50 cents in year two, right? In which case you invest a dollar, you get your dollar back after a year, you get a dollar 50 after two years. So you're basically making a 50% return over 24 months. You're making a monthly ROI of just over 2%. If you assume like a linear payout, which is actually wrong, it's going to be more, the payout is going to be more curved, I suspect, more convex. Um, but if you assume that on a linear basis, you make a 50% return over 24 months, your monthly return on investment is just over two, uh, just over 2%. Now, if you are financing it and it's costing you less than 2% to finance it, then you're gonna, you know, you're gonna grow your your business. It's gonna be more slow for sure. Um, where you have shorter ROAS periods, <clears throat> you know, if you think like a hyper casual game, so I'm investing 20 cents. I break even on day five and I make 30 cents after 30 days. That's like rocket fuel. If mm -hmm. you can continue to recycle this money super quickly, uh, you can grow very, very fast. But it's, um, you know, I mean, hyper cash is very, very you know, difficult, I think, to make money in these days um, versus, you know, it's a bit like being a farmer, right? So on one hand, you're farming salad greens, your crops to market in seven days. What could grow? What could go wrong, right? Your hydroponics can break. Whereas you're in this case, you're like farming sugarcane or something. It takes a very long time. After a year, the green shoots are coming through. And after two years, you start to get your spoils back. Um, that's just a much, much longer term game. There's a lot of things to keep the farming analogy going. There's a lot of things that could go wrong in those two years. A, the crop needs a lot of water to get it to get it through. And that water can be expensive, but B, you can have droughts, you can have disease and famine and floods and all, you know, all of these things as well. So predicting something two years out is way harder than predicting something two weeks out. So um, we've been doing some, some work recently, some recent blog posts around selecting the right sort of app or game genre where you're getting a decent return in a, um, in a, in a relatively modest period of time. So I gave a, uh, a talk I was in um, Belgrade last week, giving a talk about you know why genre matters, where the money's at, and my thesis was basically, you know, this was particularly on the gaming side, try and build, uh, you know, it, games where you have a, a, a ROAS recovery of between sixty and one hundred and eighty days. If you can do that, then that's that's what we kind of termed the sweet spot. Um, if you're building like puzzle games that have got a one year or one and a half year break even period, it takes so much capital to scale those because you're having to go very, very negative before you start to you know see the green shoot. So think about how much capital you need to scale a game or an app. And this is subscriptions or free to play. The concept's exactly the same. And if you can if you can be creating apps or games that have a shorter uh, genre, shorter break even period, it takes much less capital. And you can also use debt uh, facility to, to leverage um, and, and help grow because you can recycle the money faster. Yeah, I didn't think about it from that from that angle that you will get to a point where all of your or mo more of your subscriptions are at that uh, one year plus level and then, you know, money is streaming in. But how do you get there? Yeah, and look, think of it as a flywheel, right? So yeah. it's a flywheel of user acquisition. So you have to keep investing and then mm -hmm. gradually... And then gradually it's got some inertia. Now, if you just stop one day, yeah, <clears throat> that flywheel is gonna like it's gonna tail off and that you mm -hmm. know it may tail off over a couple of years. Yeah. Um, so short inertia, you know, like a hyper casual game is dead in 30 days. Mm -hmm. You know, a trusted match three game or a you know, a, a, a fitness tracker or whatever, you know, might have an LTV in the you know, two, three, four years. Some of these mm -hmm. guys I spoke to a, I spoke to um a company in the music space in the US. Just very recently, that they had um, you know they were still tracking users where you know they were paying you know four or five years later. So there's a lot of inertia in that particular flywheel. Yeah. Whereas if it's a really short genre game, they're dead in thirty days. So genre really matters. That's such a good point. Such a good point. Um, I know we talked about a whole bunch of numbers. We talked about uh, calculations and all these different metrics. And I know you have quite a few calculators for these sort of things that are available for free on your website. Is there one that you would recommend starting with? Um, yeah, maybe I can just share my screen and then... Um, Absolutely. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you here. So the main... Um, so this is just on 
our main website, Poland.vc, there is a tab here called calculators. So here you're going to see a lot of different, um, a lot of different, um, you know, financial terms, a lot of different user acquisition terms. Um, the one I'm, what I'm going to show you here is and there's two versions of it. There's one for subscription apps and there's one for free to play games. So I'm, I'm going to show you the free to play games one. I'm not going to go super deep on it. Everyone can have a look if they, you know, if they want, they're free to use. Um, you don't have to connect up data sources. It's like a sandbox. Um, so I'm going to look at this um, uh, here. Sorry, I just need to put in my details because I'm going to. Um, there's my email, by the way, if anyone wants to reach out. Um, so what we're trying to do here is we're looking at, you know, the top left here, we've got retention data. So how long do people stay in my, in my, in this case, a free to play game for? And then I'm tracking ARPDA, average revenue per daily active user, CPIs and acquisition cost. Yeah, you know, a few other metrics down here. And then, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna, you know, raise capital to fund it, what's my cost of capital? What we're trying to get to on this main page is an investment equation. How much in, when do I break even, and how much out? And of course, the, the red slice here in the middle is my profit. So, <clears throat> and this is what I think a lot of a lot of founders and UA managers and sometimes finance guys don't even, you know, think about it in this way, just purely as an investment equation. So here's so what we're saying, you know, in English is like we can invest a dollar, we can expect to break even around day 33, sorry, a dollar twenty, expect to break even around day 33 and go on to make a, a lifetime value of around a dollar ninety-seven after 104 days, earning ourselves a profit of 77 cents. Now, if we can do that, here I'm going to model the cash flows. So I'm going to look at the same starting budget. Now, there's two scenarios here. One, the red one, is basically like if I'm waiting to get paid um, before I uh, before I kind of um, uh, reinvest. So if you look at the red line, it goes from 100,000 down to zero in 60 days. What happens is day 67, I get my inbound payment from the platform and I continue to spend. Then I get paid and I spend. And of course, the top line is like, if you can borrow against this pool of collateral that you're this revenue you're earning and reinvest it into something you know is ROI positive, mathematically you're going to grow quicker. And that's what our that that's what our entire business is all around. Um, if I go back to the summary tab here and I look at the less pretty but very informative stats on the top right, what we're basically they articulating here is an investment equation. I invest a dollar twenty. <clears throat> expect to break even day 33. I'm going to make a dollar 97 in lifetime value after 104 days. Now, that's giving me a single shot. So for one cohort to play out the LTV, I'm expecting to make just over 64% on one L on one user acquisition cycle. But this is over 104 days. So 104 days is very difficult to compare different metrics on. So what we're going to do is just slightly crudely, to be honest, because it's it's not like a, a linear recovery. We're just going to divide that by 104, multiply it by 30 to get this monthly return on investment, monthly return on capital. So our user acquisition machine in this one is generating a very healthy 18.5% mm. monthly return. That's basically saying we can put a buck in, get a buck 18.5 on a regular basis, you know, on a scalable basis. Now, Let's say it costs you, you've run out of your own cash and you say, hey, my machine is still working. I need more capital. So I want to borrow on my revolving credit facility. So let's say you borrow the money and let's say the cost to borrow the dollar for a month. You've always got to compare things on the same basis, right? Um, so if my monthly interest cost is one and a half percent, my monthly return in the ad equation is 18 and a half percent. So my return after factoring in the one and a half percent financing cost goes from 18 and a half to 17 percent so the other way to look at it is for every dollar you're paying an in interest you're making eleven dollars 33 through expected value from the um uh from the ads equation oh wow <clears throat> so th th this is a you know this can be really useful we've got explainer videos for all this stuff on the youtube channel and so on as well um so yeah this is like a resource that we created it's been used you know a lot we have exactly the same for subscription apps here just a different set of inputs around you know different periods and price points and churn and market share etc 
So um, yeah, I will um, I'll stop showing the screen now. But you know, all of this is available just on the website pollen.vc under the calculator section. And we'll make sure to link to all of those in the description. They look cool and they work really well. And I think once you get to something like this where money is involved and we're talking big amounts, just understanding what you're up against and that 18 and a half percent, just getting to see it is so useful. So even if you're not thinking about doing this, you should at least get a better understanding of your economics to have that data, to have that sort of knowledge. So highly recommended. And again, we'll link to it in all the things that we do. Cool, thanks. We, we've had people sometimes use the calculators for, you know, sometimes a year, sometimes two years before then reaching out. So we, we <laughs> use them as a, an education tool. Obviously, it's good lead gen, but yep. it means that when people come and talk to us, they, they, they've they got a more of a defined requirement for capital that's based on, you know, an understanding of their own metrics. Yeah, and I think that's always super important to have. If you don't know your own numbers, you're really in trouble. That's what we try to do. And a lot of those uh, inputs you can fill in right from your subscription report and app figures. So if you don't know your numbers directly, go and check those out. And you should know those if you have app figures. If not, you should go and sign up. Um, cool. There's one last question in the chat that I want to bring up, even though we're running very, very low on time. And that is about fees and terms and kind of the more technical structure. Can you give us a quick rundown of what that looks like, just so people have an idea? It doesn't have to be too uh, technically detailed. I don't know if we have enough time for that. Yeah, look, sure. what we do is we charge, we, we believe in transparency a lot. So we charge a very simple rate of interest. So if you were going for, you know, if you were going for a mortgage or a car loan or something, you would want to compare different interest rates. So you're comparing everything on the, on the same level playing, playing field. So, so in order to compare the cost of any financial product, you have to break it down to an interest rate. So whether you do an annualized interest rate or a monthly interest rate, the annualized is just a monthly times 12, right? But it's a it's super transparent. You pay if you borrow a dollar for a month, you pay interest for a month. If you borrow it for a week, you pay interest for a week. So just like a bank overdraft, any kind of line of credit. Where we see it, um, you know, where we see people getting confused and sometimes really, really badly um in the in the weeds is where a lender's disguise those interest rates as some kind of fixed fee. So either it's a fixed fee percentage um, or it's some kind of revenue share, right? And there are calculators here to break down both models to an interest rate. So the fixed fee can be, you know, sometimes exorbitantly high interest rates. <clears throat> and then sometimes the, um, you know, the what seems like a nice founder friendly revenue share, hey, we're in this together, is actually disguising an interest rate of 30 to 35%. Um, so we really believe in transparency, helping you make an informed choice. The only way you can do that is to be comparing everything on a level playing field, which comes down to a, either an annualized or monthly interest rate. So you can be comparing apples with apples. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think ultimately when it comes to money, you will find more lenders out there who will give you a good story. I'm sure they exist. I haven't. I haven't seen many companies that do this or many companies that have become popular doing this. So I don't have names off the top of my head, but I think that also means that in order to really succeed, the reason you've been around since 2015 is you don't do any of those shady things. It's, yeah, I mean, like it's disguised as being sort of founder friendly and simple, but frankly, I find that a little bit patronizing to, you know, to founders, right? So that yeah. that's why, look, People are building apps, people are building games. They're not, you know, they're not necessarily sort of financial engineering wizards as well, right? That's mm -hmm. totally cool. What we're trying to do here is just provide some of the tools, some of the background. We have, um, there's also a link on our website to a guide to comparing different models. We have the calculators. We try and be as helpful as we can because what we want um, studios to do is to make the right and an informed financial decision. It's really, you know, I mean, I would say it's satisfying. It's not really that satisfying when we, you know, we work with someone, we unpick the cash flows and, you know, we show them they've been paying, we had one recently who was paying a 41.3% effective interest rate, you know, working with these revenue-based lenders. It's, you know, it's not good for the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat, but we don't have time to take them because we always try to stay on time. And somehow we ran out of time quickly again. Sometimes we do that. Um, to wrap it all up, I think that we talked about so many different things, but the high level is there is a way to fund your growth if you have uh, what you call the machine, if you have that golden formula 
where you're putting money in and you're getting more money out. And if that is the case and you do want to use this sort of system, you should go and talk to Martin. Obviously, that's the way to do it. And at least one person is going to go do that after the show. But where can people get in touch with you? And we'll link to all of those later, but just so we can have it in the video. What's Fantastic. Well, and and, and thank, thanks for that. Um, so LinkedIn is a good channel. Uh, you can reach out to me directly. It may not be me that ends up doing the call, but um, you know, just Martin McMillan, um, Poland VC should find me. Um, or even just email martin at poland.vc. Um, so pretty easy to uh to to track down. And either myself or one of my colleagues will uh, you know, gladly kind of um uh, you know, walk through, you know, whatever your requirements are and figure out if we're a good fit as a financing partner. I think that's great. I think even just that is great, just to not say we're going to work together immediately, but it's more, should we work together? Let's do it. You know what we've really learned in our business is like, there is no point in us trying to sell because a service that someone either doesn't understand, doesn't know they want, whatever. It's a terrible idea. Our entire strategy is to work to provide tools, content calculators, such that when it becomes obvious we should be working together, it's a very easy conversation to have. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's great. It's all great to hear. And like I said, I've been following you for, well, since 2015. I think we met at a conference in 2015, 16. Yeah, really, it was really early on, right? Yeah, very early into this. And we've seen the whole industry change since 2015. 2015 was kind of a pivotal, weird point. 2017 was another weird, pivotal point. But it's, uh, it's good to see that this is a growing way and that more and more studios and companies actually use this. Highly recommend it to check it out. We'll link to everything in the description. Is there anything you want to end with before we go? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think just a final comment, as you said that, is like, <clears throat> you know, as the whole kind of fundraising environment changes, so the whole VC market is drying up, not for, not for early stage. There's still a very vibrant early stage round, which is great. But when when founders were looking at sort of raising, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollar rounds for user acquisition, it's really, it's really interesting to see the market has turned a lot. There's a real focus towards, you know, what's the smartest way to do this? Not like, hey, how much can I raise at what valuation? It's like, you know, uh, how can I really sort of keep, keep, uh, keep control and make an informed decision here? So yeah. um, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, twist in the market. It's been a very net positive for, uh, for our business as well, which is cool. That's great to hear. Awesome. Before we leave, I'll just say, if you enjoyed this AF chat, please give us a like so the YouTube algorithm likes us too and shoots us to the top. I'm an organic optimization guy. I just have to do these things. And if you are not already, you should definitely subscribe to the channel. We have more of these great live streams coming up. There's another one on Apple search ads coming up in just a few weeks. I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. And then we have more. So that's where I'll end. Thank you very much, Martin. This was amazing. You shared so much information, so many numbers, and those calculators are certainly super useful. I'm going to go and check them out myself. Cool. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Of course. Take care, everyone. And we will see you in a few weeks for another round of live streams. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks.